All right, let us begin. Um, welcome to CS uh, 4510. The topic of today is the pumping lemma for context-free languages. So we're going to define a way that you could pump uh, a context-free language by using the definition of the grammar. Last time we finished the proof that PDAs were equivalent to CFGs. And in fact, you can rederive the pumping lemma for CFLs using pushdown automata, but it's just worse and ugly. Uh, so the CFL one is, I mean, excuse me, the one with the grammars is a little better. So grammar is a recursive, is a recursive device, like a PDA, excuse me, like a PDA and like a DFA, there is some sort of recursion to its definition. And this is what allows it to, it, to enumerate some sort of infinite set. Not the fact that it has infinite definitions, but the fact that it is recursive and its recursive devices can be taken an arbitrary number of times. That's what, uh, where the infiniteness comes from. But any such device that is perhaps simple in nature and has some recursive structure in it must also have some periodicity, right? Uh, just like there's a self loop on the, on the, when you did uh, the pumping lemma for regular languages, we said some state is repeated twice for uh, uh, DFAs, we'll get a, 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 a similar periodicity for, um, for CFGs. But it's going to be a little more complicated to explore what that periodicity is. It's going to end up being on the uh, parse tree. So a parse tree, in general, is like if you have some grammar, and you have uh, a sequence of productions, you can go S goes to ASB, or excuse me, S goes to ASB, goes to AA, SBB goes to AABB, something like this. You can also express the productions of a um, parse tree, uh, uh, the productions as a tree. So you could write S, and then here you can say S goes to ASB. So we say S, say A, B, something like this. And then you can say S goes also to ASB. So you can say a, uh, by convention, we bring the terminals all the way to the bottom so you can see the string in one big swoop. And then let's do one more, maybe. And then let's just do this, this guy to epsilon, right? So that would be, for example, the parse tree of AA. S, A, 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 B, 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 right? Um, now consider a general parse tree, okay? We have, let's say we have S, and let's say it produces uh, some quite large long string. And let's say in the parse tree, the, the root of the tree is always going to be S, and somehow through the, there's going to be some T, and there's going to be a T appearing again, okay? You will have, this will produce some x. And we can break up the string into five parts this way. U, V, X, Y, Z, right? Now, there are only, like there are finitely many states, there are only finitely many non-terminals, right? So, if there are V non-terminals, Uh, any parse tree of height, uh, the size of V plus 1, will have a repeated non-terminal. Why? Pigeonhole principle. Pigeonhole principle. The, if the height of the tree is t plus 1, and there are, excuse me, v plus 1, there are only v non-terminals, some non-terminal, perhaps it's even s, appears twice in the, somewhere on this path. Now, we won't really do stuff on the height of the parse tree, 
But what we will say <coughs> um, is why do we care about the, the height of the parse tree being uh, v plus 1? What does that really give us? Well, if you consider uh, this tree, implicitly what we have here is that the non-terminal t can produce in some number of steps uh, v t y, or it can also produce in some number of steps x, right? So you can substitute those in for each other. And you can perform what is called a surgery on a parse tree, and it'll look like this. Suppose after the first time you, you see a t, you don't produce uh, vty. Instead, you produce simply x. Would you agree if that parse tree is valid, so is this one? This is called a surgery on a parse tree. I simply cut with a little scissor with a tiny blade. I cut out the first part of t, the first time t was produced, and I paste it in the second time, the second string that p produced, which was whatever this was here. So this little, I cut it here, and then I cut it here, and I took this little triangle, and I surged it in there. So whatever, instead of this t producing vxy, now I'm going to make it only produce x. Do we see? Here's a second surgery we can do. Instead of cutting and pasting it that way, what I'm going to do is actually make a duplicate of the tree. So instead of this non-terminal, the second appearance of the non-terminal t producing uh, x, I'm going to have it produce vty and then have that t produce x. Do we see? So we get if here's the, here's the high level idea of the pumping lemma for context free languages. If string is long enough, and we'll derive exactly the conditions that are necessary for the string to be long enough. If the string is long enough that such as, such that the parse tree is tall enough. Uh, we get that u v x y z is an element of L implies for all i that u v to the i x y to the i z is an element of L. Okay, We'll derive exactly what conditions that'll happen. And we'll use that to be able to show a language is non-regular by showing it can't be pumped. But convince yourself that if the string is long enough, what exactly that means, we'll talk about it in a second, if the string is long enough such that in this parse tree some non-terminal appears twice, then that string can be pumped so that its productions can be done th this way. We'll take the contrapositive of that statement to, be, to mean that if the, if the string cannot be pumped, then the language is not regular. Excuse me, is not context free. Right? If uvxyz is some valid parse tree, then so is uvvxyyz. Right? Uvvxyyz. And the number of times you paste this uh, will occur. Okay. Uh, we want to now derive what, uh, what is the height of the parse tree to give us a string. We want, a, we want to enforce the string is long enough so that any parse tree of it must be of height at least v plus 1. Before we get to that, any questions on the surgery? Agree? Kind of proof by picture, so to speak? OK. Um, suppose. Uh, G is in C and F. This is not even necessary. You can do this. Con you can do this proof without assuming G is in C and F. But suppose G is in, is in Chomsky normal form. Then uh, consider a parse tree. Consider parse trees 
of height 1. Uh, if you have a parse tree of height 1, what's the longest word you can produce? Suppose we only consider the rules of the second kind, the first kind. So Chomsky normal form, right? You have A goes to BC, and then uh, capital A goes to little a. Let's forget these kinds of rules for now. Let's suppose we take those all at the end and only at the end, right? So we'll have some large straight lines at the very end, right? Something like this. And then we'll have dot, 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 dot like that, right? So we'll have a binary tree. If we have parse trees of H equals of height 1, what's the longest string we can produce? We're ignoring the vertical line. Yeah. Two, right? Yeah. So the length of W is 2. The longest word we can produce. What about parse trees of height h equals 2? What's the longest word we could produce? The longest word is less than or equal to what? 4. So if height h, um, if a tree <coughs> has height h, longest word possible to produce is of length 2 to the h. Do you agree? The longest word that you can produce in height h is 2 to the h, of length 2 to the h. So a word of length Two to the size of v plus one must have a parse tree of height what? V plus one. Or like greater than or equal to v plus one. Yeah. Which is exactly sufficient to apply the pigeonhole principle to get a duplicate non terminal. So we need to consider strings of height greater than uh, 2 to the v plus 1. Now, when we did the pumping lemma last time, we pumped on the number of states. Assume to the contrary that there exists a DFA p with some number of states p, right? Here, unfortunately, we're like, assume to the contrary. There's a context tree grammar with some number of non-terminals such that my string is longer than 2 to the v plus 1. What we're going to do to make the proof setup simpler is set uh, p equal to 2 to the size of v plus 1. Now we move the plus 1 to the exponent and not on the bottom. It's OK. Like when you do the pumping lemma, we're not concerned with the minimal p. Suppose we assume that we pumped for 2p or p plus 10 or something. It turns out it's still fine. This is an upper bound. It's certainly true that this is greater than 2 to the v plus 1, right? For enough v. So we're still OK. And that will make the proof easier, I promise. So we're going to do it generically for assume to the contrary, L is a context-free language with pumping length p. But implicitly, p is not a number of states now. It's a function of the number of non-terminals to the height of it, right? Um, we have some more conditions to derive. So we ensure that we pump something non-empty uh, and that like, recall that for the regular pumping language, we had x, y is less than or equal to p. We can concern ourselves with the first loop that appears by having x, y less than or equal to p, right? We want to concern ourselves with the last production of a certain non-terminal, OK? Um, suppose we have a tree uh, like this. What is the height of this subtree to enforce that t appears twice? We want some non-terminal to appear twice. When is that guaranteed? When you have order of v plus 1. Yes. If this subtree is of height v plus 1, 
some non-terminal is repeated twice. Now, there may be multiple repetitions of non-terminals and non-terminals. Recall for the pumping lemma, we drew it like a picture like this, like we, you know, but it's not necessarily true. It could have been like this, and then the loop could have had a loop on it or something weird, right? So it's not necessarily nice that it looks like this, and we always concerned ourselves with the first loop to occur by, that is guaranteed by the pigeonhole principle, not some later on loop. Similarly, we're concerned ourselves with the first repetition of a non-terminal that appears closer to the bottom of the tree. If the, if the subtree is of height v plus 1, we look at the last v plus 1 uh, height of that tree, some non-terminal must be, appear. Even if the height is like 2v or 10v or something, some really big tree, some non-terminal not only is guaranteed to repeat, but guaranteed to repeat in the last v plus 1 uh, repetitions, right? So if the height of uh, v plus, if the height of the repetition of this subtree that has t in it twice, and t produces vxy, what do you know is an upper bound on vxy? P, which is just 2 to the v plus 1. So we'll set, we'll allow ourselves to condition on the fact that vxy is less than or equal to p. If the height of the tree that produces vxy is at most v plus 1, then the length of v plus 1, vxy cannot be longer than 2 to the v plus 1. Now here we had a 2 to the v plus 1, and here, here we have a 2 to the v plus 1. So we'll just make everything 2 to the v plus 1, and then that's fine. It'll just call it p. We'll never even look at 2 to the v plus 1 ever again. It's just going to be p for us. Um, we have one more condition, and we want to ensure that v and y are not both empty. So we also condition on the fact that vy is greater than 0. Now, one of them could be 0, uh, but not both of them, right? Convince yourself that actually, consider a regular grammar. If you consider a regular grammar, y is always going to be empty, and v is going to be that letter that appears in the regular grammar. So in fact, given this con construction of the pumping lemma, you can derive the regular language pumping lemma, right? Any questions on what these, we'll give you the formal definition in just a second, but any question on why these two rules are okay to assume? Yes? So P, couldn't you still have more loops within the, even though it's? Yeah, but it's okay because it's a less than or equal to. Yeah. Some loop could appear sooner. Certainly, but it must appear before that. The XY can appear anywhere in the string. Yes, certainly. But in terms of the parse tree, the repeti I mean, view could be empty. Yeah. V, that's the, that, so when you had three strings, XYZ, XY was a prefix. Yeah. Now VXY is a substring. So it can appear, unfortunately, you're not bound to uh, the beginning of the string with regular languages. You're bound to some middle of the string is being pumped, rather than the, the prefix of the string being pumped. It's a little more troublesome. Yes? I'm not getting ahead, but what if it's not CNF? Ah, uh, so you could actually redo the whole thing if it's not CNF by changing 2 to the something by the max length of the right-hand side. And then you'll get, like, 3 to the something. Either way, there is some P that can be pumped. Now, we can find the minimal smallest p, and it's different for each grammar, just like the p is different for each DFA. There is some different p for each grammar. Um, but just choose something bigger than that, and then pump that. Great question. All right, here's our formula. Uh, assume to the contrary. That uh, L is context-free. with pumping length p. Choose s in l such that the length of s must be greater than or equal to p. Now, again, implicit here is the fact that p is actually some function of the longest rule of the left-hand side, assuming a right-hand side, assuming we converted the thing to Chomsky normal form, and the number of not terminals, but we're trying to prove that such a grammar doesn't exist for a language. So we just say p, and then we'll pump past any p. 
Now, here to prove that s is greater than or equal to p, what you actually will do is just choose s as a function of p, like we've done previously for regular languages. Um, for all cases, uh, s is equal to u, v, x, y, z, subject to uh, v, x, y less than or equal to p, and v, y must be greater than 0. Choose I and show uh, U, V to the I, X, Y to the I, Z is not an element of L. That's how the proof will function. Right? That's the, the formula, we'll call it, the generic outline. And that is the setup for every proof in proving a language to be context-free, and that makes it uh, simple, right? Notice that it's simply a proof by contradiction of the negation if, uh, of the statement that we want. Right. Questions on that one? All right. And again, vy being greater than 0 is because you have to pump something. If vy equals 0, the length of vy equals 0, then both v and y are empty. And then, of course, v to the i and w and uh, y to the i is the empty string. So of course it's still an L. You want to reach a contradiction, so you must pump something non-empty. Now, I'll tell you, before we get to some examples, we're just going to do three examples today and we're done. Uh, pumping a context-free language is actually a sort of a tricky to write up as a proof. I mean, like when you choose a bad S for the regular languages, you will get a proof that is just uglier. When you choose a bad S for pumping in a context-free language, it's likely you won't be able to finish the proof at all. So it's a little harder. Second trick is it's really hard to enumerate all the cases, it turns out. Like, uh, what you can really group, what you really have to do is, and you'll see through the examples, you group several cases into like large meta cases, and then the meta cases are all shown through the same contradiction, and that's the sort of the wand you had to wave. But this, I think, proving a language to be not context free is a little trickier. In fact, as you get more and more powerful classes of languages, Sometimes they have pumping lemmas until the pumping lemmas become so complicated for those classes of languages that maybe they don't exist. For example, we have evidence that suggests that there provably does not exist a context-sensitive pumping lemma, something like this. So the proofs get so complicated that they're, they're uh, uh, not of the realm anymore, so to speak. So let's prove some languages to not be context-free. Yes? Well, there's no pumping lemma, or we think there's no pumping lemma? There is strong evidence that if there did exist this context-sensitive pumping lemma, something else would be true, which we don't think should be. So I'll just I have, to, I have to word it that way, unfortunately. And we don't think that thing should be true. Um, right. Right? Let's prove a language uh, L to be not context-free. Of course, it's going to be A to the N, B to the N, C to the N, such that N is a natural number. This is our canonical non-regular language. Excuse me, not, not only is it not regular, it's also not context-free. And we'll prove it's not context-free today. Okay? So we want to prove A to the N, B to the N, C to the N is not context-free. You can also, before proving a language to be not context-free, you can also bring some intuition about why it's not context-free. Right? A to the N, B to the N is context-free because the PDA pushes the A's and then pops the A's to match the B's. Right? But then when you read this string, you push the A's, you pop the, pop the A's to match the B's, you're out of you're out of the stack, so how do you match the Cs, right? In some sense, a PDA or a CFG can do one thing at a time. How can a, this language, in some sense, requires you to do two things at a time? Can't really do two things at a time. Um, how would we prove this? Assume to the contrary. L is context-free with pumping length p. Choose s is equal to what? a to the p, b to the p, c to the p. Yep. Kind of a sane choice. Uh, notice s is an L, and the length of s is greater than or equal to p. Consider all cases 
S is equal to U V X Y Z subject to V X V X Y is less than or equal to P and V Y is greater than zero. We have two large meta cases, and a meta case isn't a real thing; it's just a case. Case one: uh, either V or Y or both. It's an inclusive or contain more than one symbol. If V or Y contain more than one symbol, what's our contradiction here? We'll choose I is equal to 2. Uh, excuse me, I is equal to 0. Uh, no, no, 2. I equals 2. So U, V, X, Y, uh, U, V squared, X, Y squared, Z contains uh, letters out of order. Do we see why that's true? Consider the string like this. I'll write it like this. I'll write the proof and then I'll over explain it. We have A to the P, B to the P, C to the P. It looks like this. A, A, B, B, C, C, right? And V, U, V, X, Y, Z is somehow like this, right? U, uh, we'll say this is V, V, X, Y, right? V, X, Y less than equal to P is some substring of this, okay? Somehow, perhaps, it, either V or Y overlap the A's and the B's. So then when you pump it, you'll get A's, B's, then you'll get A's and B's again, and then you'll get B's and C's, right? Or B's, VXY is somehow in here, and either V or Y contain both B's and C's simultaneously, right? This case actually is several cases where V is A's and B's, or Y is A's and B's, or V's and B's is C's, or Y is B's or C's. So this is a big case that actually incorporates four cases. Either one of them contain more than one symbol. If you pump it, you'll get them out of order, right? Suppose it was just this one A and one B, and you pumped it, okay? You get A, dot, 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 A, but then you would also get uh, B, A, B, dot, 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 B, right? C, dot, 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 C. And that would contain a B before an A, and that would be out of order. So if V or Y contain more than one symbol, I equals 2 will put the letters out of order, okay? Case 2. Now, you want your cases to be total in the sense they obviously cover all possibilities. So if you only have two cases, the case two should be the negation of case one, logically. If either V or Y contain more than one symbol, what is the opposite of that? What is all possible other cases? V and Y both contain like one symbol, exactly. Both V and y, so it's like a, a negation of an or becomes an and, both v and y contain one symbol. Now, I'm not saying the same symbol, just one symbol, OK? What's our contradiction? There are two of v comma y, but three of a, b, c. Choose i is equal to 2, then uh, u v squared x y squared z has one letter not increased. For both cases, We see u uh, uh, excuse me u v squared x y squared z is not an element of L, so L is not context free. Let me over explain where the second case came from. What this means is either uh, v and y are both only a's. So then they're pumping some number of A's. You'll get A to the P plus something, B to the P, C to the P. Maybe they're both B's. Maybe they're both C's, but there's no straddling of the midpoints. Maybe V is A's and Y is B's. Maybe V is B's and Y is C's. Why can't V be A's and Y be C's? Yeah? Because 
then when you pump it, you'll have some number more A's, some number more C's, but the same number of B's? So that's why we get a contradiction, and that is true. But I'm cons uh, if you have three things and two choices, you usually have three choose two options, six. But I, I claim the case that V is A's and Y is C's does not have to be considered at all. When we wrote the proof out, it wasn't obvious that we ignored that case. But it turns out that's not actually a real case. Why not? Because then V, X, Y would be greater than P. Yeah, the, the last A is over P apart from the first C. So V, X, Y is the small string in terms of it, right? It's a short substring of it and in terms of P. So it can't touch the A's and the C's simultaneously. They're, B, they're P, B's apart. There's too many symbols between them. And the pumping lemma for context for regular languages, sometimes you use that to your advantage to, to get something, right? So this is the proof that ADN, BDN, CDN is not context-free. Questions on this proof? We'll do another complicated one in a second. Yes? So this is part of the condition that x, y is the same. Uh, if you write out the proof differently, case one really here is four cases. Case two is six minus one is five cases. There's really nine cases, right? Certain cases, you, and e, you can either write out all possible cases and then eliminate them if they don't satisfy this constraint, or you can only write out the cases that do satisfy this constraint. But as written here, they're grouped in such a way that we didn't even have to deal with that. They all implicitly happen. It happens anyway. Now, sometimes you may need that. For this example, and it's specific, it won't need that. More questions? This one? We'll do a, let's do a harder one. Let's do one with more cases. Consider uh, a to the uh, i, b to the j, uh, c to the k, such that i is less than or equal to j, uh, j which is less than or equal to k. So when choosing an S, you want it to be barely in the language. You want it to be in such a way that any perturbance to the string, an inserted or removed character, almost anywhere, will destroy the string and not be contained in the set builder notation of the language anymore. So let's just prove this is uh, not context free. Assume to the contrary. L is context free. Uh, with pumping length p. Uh, choose s is equal to what? What's a good choice of s here? Same. Yeah, it's going to be a to the p, b to the p, c to the p. But notice when we, when, just to foreshadow a little bit, when we break this up, we'll have to be careful, OK? If you pump up the number of C's, you don't, you're still in the language. If you pump down the number of A's, you're still in the language. Right? So you have to be careful exactly how you break this one up. So unfortunately, for this one, we have several more cases. Uh, notice uh, that S is an element of L, yay, and the length of S is greater than or equal to P. Again, P is this abstract pumping. Uh, Length in terms of the number of non-terminals and the height of the parse tree. Um, so case one, B or uh, uh, four, uh, S is equal to U, V, X, Y, Z, uh, subject to X, V, X, Y is less than or equal to P, and uh, V, Y is greater than zero. We have two cases. Case one, uh, V or Y contain more than one symbol. Uh, v or Y. Then one symbol. Choose 
i equals 2. Uh, then u v squared x y squared z will contain uh, letters out of order. So uh, u v squared x y squared z is not an element of L. Right. Same case as the first one. Uh, case two. Uh, again, the negation of this should be v or y contain more, uh, contain v and y, excuse me, v and y, both contain one type of symbol, or one kind of symbol, right? If v and y both contain one kind of symbol, maybe v and y are both A's, maybe V and Y are both B's, maybe V and Y are both C's, maybe V and uh, V is A's, Y's is B's, and V is B's and Y's is C's. Okay, so this case actually is five cases, and each of the cases uh, can be broken up into certain. You need to break this case up into several cases depending upon if you need to pump up or down. So there's two ways you could do it is like if A's appear and then B's don't appear or something like this. But I think it may be clearer for us to just write out uh, all the cases, right? So we'll say subcase A, we'll say if V and Y are both uh, elements of, let's say, A star, choose I is equal to what? Yeah, you want to pump up. Uh, case B, if V and Y are both elements of B star, choose what? Zero. You pump down, you will have more A's than B's. So actually, let me, let's finish writing this case. Uh, U, V squared, X, Y squared, Z will have more um, A's than B's. If V, Y are both in elements of B, you chose what? Zero. Turns out for B, it's both. Zero or two. If you choose zero, you pump down. You won't have, you'll still have less B's than C's, which is fine, but you'll have more A's than C's. Uh, excuse me, A's and B's. U, V squared, X, Y, excuse me, U, U, X, Z will have more A's than B's. Uh, if V comma Y is an element of C star, choose I is equal to what? Zero. Huh? Zero again? Yeah. Zero. U, X, Z will have more B's than C's. Okay? What if V is an element of A star, but B is an element, excuse me, Y is an element of B star? Choose I is equal to what? This one's tricky. Or is it? Two. Yeah. Will it? Let me double check. What if y is empty? Yeah, so we'll, we'll have either more a's than b's or more b's than c's. Uh, what if v is an element of b star and y is an element of c star? Choose i is equal to what? Zero. Zero, yeah. If, let's think about the or case this time. So if, you've, if uxz will have some, optionally have either b's or c's removed from it, so it should have either more a's than b's or more b's than 
it'll have, um, will have more A's than B's or more A's than C's, which it also can't happen, right? Not B's than C's than A than C's, okay? Um, what about V element of A star, Y element of C star? <coughs> What's wrong with this case again? Now, we had to choose five i's for case two. But either way, convince yourself that the cases are total. Case one is v or y contain more than one symbol. So if it's not in case one, it must fall in case two, which is v and y can both contain one kind of symbol. So convince yourself that if both v and y contain one kind of symbol, these are the only five possible choices. Uh, since... Uh, for each case, we chose i such that a u v square, a u, uh, u v to the i x y to the i z is not an element of L. L cannot be context free. Here we go. Harder language to prove. Unfortunately, a to the n, b to the n, c to the n, great. You just perturb it a little bit. You're out of, the, out of the way. This one, you have to know which way to perturb it, unfortunately. So it requires more cases. And already you can see how much more tedious this is than the pumping lemma for regular languages. Right? Questions on that proof. Now, could you write that up shorter? Absolutely. There's a, probably a creative way you guys can find out to break this up into, more, into fewer cases. And then just swipe and get all those cases done for free. So maybe something to think about. Can you do this longer? Of course you can. And I don't want to think about that. But it's possible that could occur. One final proof. Any questions on that one? We'll do one more. We have one more canonical language that we use as an example for everything. We use WWR as a canonical, like our second good non uh, regular language, which happens to be context free. But it turns out that WW did not have a grammar, right? WWR, even length palindromes, had a context free grammar and also a PDA for it. WW, I claim, does not have a PDA or context free grammar. Your homework problem was to give a a PDA with two stacks to decide this language. Since we proved that the context-free languages are exactly those which can be decided by PDAs, you, and you gave a, a two-stack PDA for that language, after you finish this proof, you should convince yourself that the two-stack PDA is therefore more powerful than the one-stack PDA. That's a, a valid dedu deduction, I think, from those rules. Let's prove that this language is not context-free. Assume to the contrary. L is a CFL with pumping length Can you guys read that? Choose Choose S is equal to Now, this one I think is hard to choose. What is a good string in S to choose to pump? A, B to the P, A, B to the P. So like A, B, okay, parentheses, A, B, all that to the P, and then the same thing next to it. Ah. So this is a language, I think, that has several wrong answers for the S to choose. When you choose a wrong answer in the pumping lemma, for regular languages, the proof is just longer. Here, you may not reach a contradiction. Why is that maybe not a good choice of S? It's an obvious choice. This, this was also my first choice in S. You can 
can just pump A, B, A, B. Let you, there is a, you want to show that there's no way to break up S into U, V, X, Y, Z to pump it. But there is a way to break that one up into pump it. Let's, let like V be A, B, and then let Y be A, B. Yeah. Can you do A to the P, B to the P, A to the P, B to the P? I'm going to do 0 to the P, 1 to the P, 0 to the P, 1 to the P, which by homomorphism is the same language. Uh, here's another bad choice of uh, S. Uh, A to the 2P, any pump of that. In fact, there's no pump of that that doesn't work, right? So every pump of that works, um, except an odd length choice of S or, or something, right? Um, now, there are several strong S's that you could go through. I would encourage you to try to find them. This is like one of the only ones I think that works. This is the only choice of S I think works. Um, you can't exactly do the one we did for the regular languages. We did 0 to the P1, 0 to the P1. It turns out that doesn't work for a slight case, I think. This is surprisingly the only, the shortest proof of this one. Okay. Um, you could also do like 0, 1 to the P, 0, 1 to the P. It could also work, I think. Because you'd like just miss the thing that you would need to, to pump. I disagree. 0, 1 to the P, 0, 1 to the P. Have V be right there and have Y be right there. It'd be, you could do 0 to the p plus 1, 0 to the p plus 1, right? Many, many wrong choices. That's another wrong choice, yeah. I mean, like, the language where you have ww, but you remove all of these cases is context-free? All the cases, all the infinite subsets enumerated like this, is that still context-free? Like, if you take all of these, the language ww for ww star, but you remove all words that are of this form. What is the form? Uh, like 0 to the p, 1 to the p. Oh, I see. Are you asking, is there any other case that could work? Um, you, perhaps the case is not even well defined, because you could try 0 to the 2p, 1 to the 2p. No, I mean, okay, I mean more like this. Like, take the language ww star. Yes. Then you remove all, like, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. And then could you prove that's context? What, like that? Yeah. Um, this is not the only string, certainly, that works. You could try, here's a string that's not in there that may still work. Uh, 0 to the 2p, 1 to the p. 0 to the 2p, 1 to the p. So there perhaps are countably infinitely many subsets of that that look like that. Um, let's say if you remove them all. You could also, like, annoyingly count up with zeros in between, so you'd have, like, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1 to the 3, 0. To yes, the yes. Numbers. There's a sequence where each, subs, each subsequence appears infinitely often. I guess, so the point for me is to find the most beautiful proof. And I guess your question is, is this the only beautiful proof? Um, and I, I suppose the answer fully would be I don't know. Because I, I don't know the scope of proof in this one. Great question, though. Let's proceed. Uh, S is an L, great. And the length of S is greater than or equal to P, great. Uh, for all cases, uh, S is equal to U, V, X, Y, Z, subject to V, X, Y, is less than or equal to P, and uh, V, Y is greater than zero. We have, in fact, only two meta cases, case one. Uh, VXY is all in the left half or right half. Okay, so suppose you have 0 to the P, 1 to the P, and you choose VXY to be all in the left half or all in the right half, okay? Uh, choose I is equal to 2, and let uh, let uh, u v squared x y squared z equal uh, w1 w2. Okay? If vxy is in the first half, uh, if vxy is in first half, 
uh, W1 begins with 0. Uh, W2 begins with a 1. So W1 does not equal W2. What I'm basically doing in here is I'm suppose I'm in the first half. Doesn't matter where I break it up, and, but inflate. When you inflate in there, you pump in there, you moved definitely one one to the other half. Perhaps you pull, if you pumped an odd, amount, an odd amount, you're already in a contradiction because this language only contains even length strings. But suppose you pumped an even amount and a positive even, even, even amount. You pump a positive even amount in there, you're going to push a one onto the other side. Okay? You push a one onto the other side, you have um, the second half, therefore, must begin with a one, and the first half, as you see, still begins with a zero. So the first half does not equal the second half. If uh, vxy is in second half, uh, w1 ends with uh, 0, w2 ends with a 1. That's why this string is so fragile. Any small inflation on either half uh, must therefore uh, push the first half to start or end in a different way than the second half starts or end, right? Case two. Now, if vxy is all in the left half or all in the right half, what is the opposite of that case? Vxy crosses the middle. Yeah. Suppose vxy straddles the middle. Choose i is equal to 0. Okay. Then uh, uxz is going to be equal to 1 to the p. Because it straddles the middle, by the way, and these are p apart, if it straddles the middle, it can't ever touch that 0 block, and it can't ever touch that 1 block, because x, vxy is less than equal to p. Uh, this is equal to 1 to the p, oh, excuse me, uh, 0 to the p, 1 to the k, uh, one, uh, 0 to the j, 1 to the p, with both k, j not equal to p. Okay. Now, we have pumped down. We chose i equals 0. So we removed some number of 1s and or some number of zeros, or maybe both, or maybe one or the other. But we removed some number of zeros. But notice uh, 0 to the p, 1 to the k, 0 to the j, 1 to the p is an element of L uh, if and only if k is equal to j is equal to p. So uxz is not an element of L. Since for all cases, uh, for all cases, u, v, i, x, y, i, z is not an element of L. L is not context-free. Uh, let's, let's discuss where the final contradiction came from. Right? Can you convince yourself that if you remove some number of ones here, the most ones that it could, could appear in the first half of the word is strictly less than, either the number of ones appears in the first half is strictly less than the ones in the second half, or the number of zeros in the second half is strictly less than the number of ones in the first half, number of zeros in the first half, or both of those conditions. Either way, a string of this form can only be in the language if and only if k equals j equals p. If k is even one less than p, or they're both less than p, or any combination of them both not equaling exactly p, it's not of the form ww. It's only of the form ww if and only if k equals j equals p. Again, showing the fragility of this specific choice of string and why I was able to carry the proof home. Right. Any further questions on pumping a context-free language? I'll say such arguments can be used to, sh to prove that a subsets of certain programming languages are, are context-free, not context-free. So sometimes certain programming languages are Certain programming languages are specified by a context-free grammar. The, like, uh, 
the correct syntactically valid programs, not maybe ones that compile or maybe ones that don't have runtime errors, but ones that the, the checker says are syntactically valid are ones which can be correctly parsed by some context-free grammar that is stored as part of the specification of the language. But even that these languages are defined with context-free gra grammars, you can construct certain counter-example counter subsets like this of the language, proving that the languages are not necessarily context-free, but almost context-free. So C, for example, is defined by a context-free grammar, but is actually provably not context-free. So, but in use, it's close enough to being context-free. Kind of an interesting uh, insight there into PL. Yes? Use a variable that's like after it's defined or something like that? Basically. So, like the counterexample looks something like uh, v1, you say you declare int v1, int v2, and then you say v1 takes on 0, v2 takes on 0, right? That's kind of like ww, right? If you pump in the first half, you'll have undeclared variables that are not used. If you pump in the second half, You'll have assignments to variables which are not declared. You pump in the middle, something else goes wrong. Right? Something like this. More questions? Excellent.